I have got Scott Ritter with me today, uh, January the 18th. Scott, good to see you. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Scott, this week, the NATO defence chiefs are having a series of meetings in Europe, in Brussels and in Germany, um, and it's the expectation is they're going to ramp up military aid to Ukraine um, in support of Ukraine. Um, I mean, they've already been ramping up military aid, so how, how they can go any higher is a good a good question, but they're going to ramp up military aid to Ukraine, they're, they're warning. Um, we've had Challenger tanks, Leopard tanks being discussed and uh, more uh, long range uh, missiles. Do you see, here's the question, do you see this Ukraine conflict escalating to a direct NATO-Russia war? Well, we are in a direct NATO-Russia war. I mean, that's just the statement of fact. Let me make the following point as clear as possible. Every NATO nation that's providing heavy weaponry and providing transit support to that weaponry to Ukraine for the purpose of closing with and destroying Russian forces through firepower maneuver is a party to the conflict. And Russia has every right under international law to interdict this supply on those territories. You know, these aren't innocent parties. Germany is not an innocent party. England is not an innocent party. And let me make the other point. If, if Russia was the United States and other nations were doing this to America, we would be striking logistic depots in England. Uh, we would be striking uh, transport hubs in Germany and Poland uh, because that's what nations do to defend themselves. Russia is has engaged in what I would call responsible escalation management. Russia is not seeking a conflict, a direct conflict with NATO forces. But, um, you know, it, 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 why don't I let the uh, defense minister of Ukraine speak? For everybody when he says that this is a proxy conflict between NATO and Russia, with Ukraine being the proxy. Ukraine is providing the blood. NATO must provide the equipment. I mean, th that's what this is, a proxy war between NATO and Russia. And I think the world should be grateful that Russia has a mature leader in President Vladimir Putin who doesn't overreact to these gross um, provocations by by the West, because this, simply put, the West is at war with Russia. I mean, you hear them say it over and over again. We cannot afford to allow a Russian victory. Why? Because the West will lose. Uh, you know, well, you're going to lose anyways, the West. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you do. But the bottom line is this is extraordinarily provocative, extraordinarily irresponsible. And if we had any other leadership in place in Russia besides the one we have, extraordinarily dangerous. Mm. So, Scott, you know, following on from what you've said there uh, about this being a situation of, of direct, you know, NATO in, is directly involved uh, via Ukraine. I mean, should Russia take the war to NATO and hit their t NATO assets? I mean, you talked about logistical centers in Germany or, or other NATO members. What's Why should Russia not, or should Russia do that? Should they hit these logistical centers? Let me put it this way. I hear NATO members say, we're providing this equipment to Ukraine so that Ukraine can defeat Russia militarily. And the defeat is quantified in terms of um, retaking the four territories that were acquired by Russia through the referendum in September and Crimea. I will make the following point. If Ukraine was ever successful in doing that, Russia would attack every single NATO member. So this is a nightmare for the West um, because they what, they claim to want something. The end result will be a direct conflict between Russia and NATO, which will probably escalate to nuclear war and represent the end of all humanity as we currently know it. So the West is willing to sacrifice the world in defense of a Ukrainian government that continues to embrace the odious ideology of Stepan Bandera. So we're willing to sacrifice the world for one of the most evil men on the planet. Um, that's insane. Fortunately, uh, Russia isn't going to lose this conflict. Russia will defeat uh, whatever NATO brings in, which means Russia is defeating NATO. And NATO needs to understand that. Um, you know, NATO is committing itself to 
Ukrainian military success that will not be forthcoming. And so NATO is quantifying this conflict in terms of black and white. Um, it's a zero-sum game. If Russia wins, NATO loses. Well, Russia is going to win, which means NATO is going to lose. Um, I don't believe, however, NATO is going to intervene in Ukraine um, if Russia wins. NATO is not going to put troops on the ground, boots on the ground. And that's the difference. You see, for Russia, this is an existential struggle. Russia will do everything required to win this conflict. NATO speaks in terms of existentialism, but they don't mean it. A defeat in Ukraine is not, for instance, the end of Poland, the end of the European Union, the end of the Baltics. Um, it's just the end of a NATO-led uh, war of aggression using Ukraine against Russia. Russia will limit this conflict to Ukraine and Ukraine alone. Well, could it spell the end of NATO then if Russia goes the, the direction that you're saying? Um, will, that, will that entail the end of NATO? Will NATO collapse? Well, I don't think we're going to see NATO collapse overnight. But what I do think we'll see is uh, the beginning of um, the deepening of an existing fracture between old Europe and new Europe. Um, already we see within the ranks of old Europe, the, the original NATO members, um, a recognition that when this war ends, Europe's going to have to deal with Russia. Uh, we heard that statement from the Dutch prime minister um, in Davos. We've also heard Emmanuel Macron make the same sort of statements and uh, Schultz in, in Germany doing the same thing. Um, the new Russia or new Europe, the east of Bol uh, Poland, the Baltics, Czech Republic, Romania, they all have um, embraced uh, extraordinarily uh, aggressive rhetoric about the need for NATO expansion, the need for NATO growth, uh, it, the increase in NATO military expenditures. But let me make this point clear. New Europe can't stand on its own. Poland is nothing without old Europe. The Baltics are nothing without old Europe. Romania is nothing without old Europe. And so at the end of the day, old Europe is going to be in the driver's seat. And right now there seems to be a recognition that there is going to have to be some sort of new European security framework developed between Europe and Russia. Um, ideally, from the European standpoint, it would be a European security framework developed with a defeated Russia. But that's not going to happen. Russia is going to win. And so Europe's going to have to learn how to deal with this victorious, invigorated, empowered Russia uh, to come up with a European security framework that will undoubtedly be rejected by the East. So we're looking at some very difficult times ahead. Um, and, and, you know, the irony is that NATO may be the only structure capable of holding Europe together long enough for um, a new European security framework to, to emerge, uh, that the greatest risk to European security would be the dissolution of Europe, um, leaving the, the new European countries of, uh, of the East uh, alone, scared, desperate, and possibly inclined to do something precipitous regarding Russia. Yeah. Let's go, just go back a step, Scott. Um, could you envisage Russia hitting a NATO target outside of Ukraine? You know, train track in Poland, uh, you know, moving Leopard tanks, for example, to, towards Ukraine. Do you, do you see that being a possibility? Would Russia take a step like that? Let's put it this way. Uh, General Zeluzny, the uh, chief of the uh, Ukrainian Armed Forces, in an interview with The Economist magazine last year, said that uh, in order for him to win, be able to win against Russia, uh, he would need 300 tanks, 500 infantry fighting vehicles, 500 artillery pieces, and unlimited ammunition, basically two divisions worth of, uh, of equipment that would enable him to launch an offensive against the, uh, the, the city of um, Melitopol, um, he, uh, and in doing so, he would sever the land bridge connecting uh, Russia with Crimea, and then he would be able to threaten Crimea. Um, so let's say that uh, NATO provides General Zeluzhny with the equipment he needs and the trained resources he needs, and he is able to successfully carry out this, uh, this attack, and he captures Melitopol, putting Crimea at risk. Russia will not sit by idly, uh, and Russia will do everything necessary to disrupt the flow of weaponry into Ukraine, which means Russia will strike targets in Poland, in Germany, and elsewhere. So, you know, NATO has to be careful what they ask for, because if they actually get what they claim they want, 
it will be a general war between Russia and NATO. Mm. And do you think at that point, NATO would sober up and actually begin the art of diplomacy to try to find a solution, a, a, a political solution here? No, I, I don't believe so. Unfortunately, NATO is on autopilot at that point, and um, uh, Article 5 would be uh, uh, invoked. And there are enough um, irresponsible players, especially amongst the new European members, uh, that there would be a, uh, uh, a ground war between NATO and Russia that would inevitably lead to a general nuclear exchange and terminate uh, termination of all life on Earth as we know it. So I mean, basically what I'm saying is NATO is a, is a suicide pill for the world. The world needs to understand that. NATO doesn't protect anybody. Yeah, Scott, well said. Uh, so how do we stop that? How, what, what, how do we prevent that scenario? We have nothing to do with it, unfortunately. The, the die has been cast. Um, uh, Russia has to win. And I, I, I say this um, as an American who spent much of my adult life training to close with and destroy the Russian enemy through firepower and maneuver. It's not as though I uh, grew up wanting a Russian victory. But when I take a look at the situation in the world today, and I take a look at the fact that this Ukrainian conflict is derived from um, two decades of uh, warlike behavior and rhetoric on the part of NATO, the United States, and others against Russia, you, seeking to use Ukraine as a proxy uh, to uh, damage, destroy, undermine, and ultimately uh, cause the downfall of Russia, um, you know, a Russian victory is the only thing that takes us off that path. And fortunately for the world, Russia's position to uh, be able to carry out this victory. And I think anybody in the world, and this is the greatest irony of all, if you're someone who loves peace, somebody who hates war, somebody who wants uh, a, a world where people live in peaceful coexistence, pray for a Russian victory. Pray for a Russian victory, because that's the only thing that will bring, bring, bring peace to the world. Scott Ritter, thank you very much for your insights. Thanks for having me.